watercolour sunset painting. That's what we're going to look at in this video. Welcome back to my channel. If we haven't met before, my name is Michelle and on this channel you'll find all things watercolour as well as a little bit of mixed media and colour mixing. So do consider subscribing, it's free and if you click the little bell icon you can get notified each time I have a new video for you. Now in this video I'm going to go through a full painting tutorial. It's going to be a very simple little watercolour but nevertheless if you'd like to you can follow along with me as I go through each step. It won't be a real-time tutorial but nevertheless I will show you each step in the painting and you can make one of your own if you would like to. And as we go through this tutorial, I'm also going to give you my 10 rules for sunset paintings. Now before you all kick off in the comments and say, well I don't agree with this or I don't want to do that, it's fine that they're not rules that I'm inflicting on you. These are the rules that I apply to my own paintings, which I am sharing with you in case you find some of them or even all of them useful. So these are informed by years of making my own sunset paintings and also by teaching other people to make sunset paintings. And I've seen the same mistakes and the same problems come up again and again. So I'm hoping that you will find these 10 rules really useful in helping you improve your own paintings. So my first rule is to paint your sunsets on stretched paper. Now I'm not going to be working from any one photograph today but I've got a selection here from my collection of photographs. Um, this one's a postcard, some are cut from books and this one I think I actually took myself. So I'm probably going to be doing a, um, a seascape like this one simply because it's the uh, the quickest thing that I can get down on uh, on paper for you and we want to concentrate mostly on the sky anyway in this tutorial so I'm not going to worry too much about foreground so those are the photos that I've got kind of as uh, as loose inspiration and here's my board of stretched paper now the reason I like to use stretched paper for sunsets particularly is because there's nothing that uh, gets you throwing a lot of water about um, as much as a sunset so really important if you don't work on stretch paper, you don't want to work on stretch paper, then the next thing would be a gummed pad for you. But I'm going to work on this paper because I know that once it dries, even though it's a bit bumpy when I'm working on it, once it dries, it'll be completely flat. If you don't know how to stretch paper, I've got a video which I will uh, link to above. And so you can go and check that out and it'll walk you step by step through the process. Really quick, really simple. It'll even save you a little bit of money because you can buy it slightly thinner paper. Rule number two is to work within a limited palette. So look at all these paints, where do you even start? Now, when I talk about working in a limited palette, I'm talking about within each painting. I'm not saying that I don't own many colors of paint because, I mean, to be honest, it's getting out of hand and people send me samples now as well, which I absolutely love. I'm actually going to, um, I'm thinking about swatching every single paint uh, paint color that I own and perhaps even putting those on my website. I know artists that do that. I know people find it really useful. I love having lots of tubes of paint. So it's not about not using many colors in general. It's about using a limited palette within a single painting. Now that's most important with a landscape because landscapes are bathed in a certain kind of light and sunset landscapes are all bathed in that sunset light. Each particular sunset in each country, in each weather condition will have its own light. And by using this very, very limited range of colors, everything will hang together nicely. So what I'm saying is that if you've used a blue and a yellow in your sky, and then you're looking at making a green for the foreground, you want to use the blue and the yellow that you've already used. So you want to, in as far as possible, use the same colors for mixing everything. So that's your grays, your darks, everything wants to be mixed from that limited color palette and we're actually only going to use four colors today. So the first of those three colors will be primary colors and I'm looking at using warm primary colors. So I'll be using a blue, a pink or red and a yellow. Rule number three is to include at least one staining color. So why add a staining color? Now we're going to be using three primary colors and I'm going to add our staining color on top of that. Now, the reason is that for a sunset to be um, to be effective, you're going to need some very strong darks. And so you're going to need a dark color and that would be a staining color. Now, if your three primaries included a blue that was already a staining color, for instance, Prussian or indigo, one of those very strong blues, then you could just paint with those three colors. But I often add an additional color in just so that I've got more colors in there. So what is your staining color? 
or you can choose that you could have um, one of the dark blues that I've mentioned so that would be Prussian that might be indigo even a phthalo blue will give you some fairly strong darks for the purples we've got things like this permanent blue violet I might actually use this one today and then you've got things like Payne's grey or even burnt umber not technically a staining colour but it's dark enough that you can use it in your paintings so you want to make sure that one of your colours is very very strong and very very dark if you only choose pale colours you're never going to get a very effective sunset so choose your three primaries if they don't include a staining colour add one in it can be a blue it can be a violet it can be a grey or it can be a brown you won't find um, very dark colors um, that would be considered really staining colors in the yellows and the reds might be a little bit tricky so those are your main options is your blues and your neutrals rule number four is don't use black so let's talk about keeping your sunsets colorful now black is a very dull color it tends to be slightly sort of on the brownish side and it doesn't reflect any light so it's not really helpful in sunsets now what beginners often find is they, they get a photograph of a sunset and there appears to be an awful lot of black in it now if that color actually is black it's just that the photograph has made it look black it's really important to understand that black may look good in photographs it doesn't often look good in paintings now I'm not 100% against using black but I'm going to tell you you don't want it in sunsets it really does kill them dead and they just looks kind of harsh and unnatural I'm going to put some pictures up while I'm talking so that you can see some of my own paintings where I have used all manner of things for the trees and for the darks and for the foreground I've used sort of you know a strong navy blue a strong, strong brown a burgundy a purple a grey absolutely anything is better than using black in your sunsets so if you're looking at your sunsets I want you to try and find the colour within them and just by sticking to the colours we're going to use today you'll find that you can avoid black anyway but you can avoid black in any sunset just by including that staining colour that we talked about previously so you get these beautiful strong colourful darks that will look really really alive and not dead so just before we finalise uh, which colours we're going to use let's get started on the drawing so I'm going to put a horizon line um, a bit lower than halfway but not quite a third of the way down now when I want a straight line what I do is I make dots like this with a set square because I don't know about you if I try and draw a straight line I'll be going all off on a slant so I just put some little dots there and what this does is it allows you to get the impression of a hand drawn line without actually drawing along a ruler which can look very very strange and then because this is a seascape perhaps we'll just have the impression of some land masses I mean you can make it you know more interesting you could put some rocks in the foreground or a boat or anything that you want but I really want in this um, in this video just to concentrate on the sky tutorial otherwise it will be sort of five hours long so let's just put a horizon line some sea and some rocks and distant uh, distant hills Rule number five is to avoid lemon yellow. So this rule about avoiding lemon is not an exact rule, by which I mean I don't follow it in every single painting. I probably have used lemon yellow in a sunset. I probably will use lemon yellow in a sunset. I've certainly seen photographs that um, warrant using lemon yellow, although a lot of them are photoshopped, I would say. So here I have um, some Daniel Smith lemon yellow, and here I have talons rembrandt cadmium yellow light so i'm not talking about making a big jump and only using sort of orangey yellows and things like indian yellow i'm just pointing out that if you use lemon like this it's very acid it's rather cool and it's a little hard to get that warmth in the sunset it's much easier if you just at least go up one little notch so this would be your cadmium yellow light and possibly something like an aerolian just so that you've got that touch of warmth in it. The other reason is that because this is so acid and so green based, it's really, really easy if you get something in this by mistake to accidentally make green. 
So I would think very, very carefully before using lemon. As I said, it's not an exact rule. I don't follow it every time, but just so much easier to get that lovely warmth in your sunset if you start at least from this kind of warmth and go up from there. You can use any of those warm yellows and oranges too. So let's choose our colours now. If you're following along, you don't have to use the exact same colours as me, but I've decided I'm going to use this, um, this Winsor & Newton transparent yellow. If you are choosing your yellows as well as avoiding lemon yellow, you might want to consider avoiding very muddy yellows as well, like Naples yellow and yellow ochre. I'm going to use this manganese blue from Daniel Smith. It's a lovely bright colour. Again, with the blues, one that might be a little tricky to use if you're a beginner is ultramarine. Cobble as well could be a bit difficult. Other than that, any of those staining blues, any of the strong blues or cerulean blue will be fine. For my red, I'm going to use this pearlescent pink shimmer from Jackman's Art Materials. They're a tiny little British brand. I've got a discount code you can use if you're interested in those shimmer paints. They've actually got sparkles in, so I can't resist throwing a little bit of that one in. And for my dark colour, for my staining colour, I've chosen this permanent blue violet. But as I said at the beginning, any of those other blues, browns, greys that are very strong and very clean, you could use any of those. But these are the colours that I am going to use today. I'll write them down in the description as well so that you can find them if you need them. Rule number six is apply your warm colours first. So let's get started and we're going in with a big brush and clean water. So I've got a flat brush here, very easy for applying the water. I'm going to apply it over the whole of the sky and bring it right down. I'm going to go over these rocks as well because everything in a sunset is layered on top of each other. Everything is bathed in the same light so it won't matter at all that the sky is going to go over the top of these rocks. By doing this you avoid any sort of white edges where you've tried to go round some things and drop them in afterwards. So you're taking your clean water all the way down to that horizon line and I want you to avoid puddles. So make sure there's no puddles. Dry your brush if necessary on a rag. So I'm going straight in now with my yellows and pinks. So why do I say paint the, uh, the warm colours first? It's a bit like when you're painting flowers. If you don't get these bright colours in first, it's easy to not leave enough room for them. So I want to get these, you know, these are the most important colours. These are the colours that are going to make our sunset really glow. So I want to get them in first. So I'm sweeping along with my pink and my yellow. And you'll see where I go over the top of the yellow there with the pink, I get these delightful sort of sun set oranges and I can take them right across right across the rocks and right down to the horizon so I'm getting some nice streaks in here I'm not going to work on it too long I'm going in with quite dry paint you don't want to go in with very very wet paint otherwise you'll just get a load of back runs I'm going to take a little bit up here I'm leaving plenty of room at the top for my blues Rule number seven is to work in layers. So as if by magic, this layer of paint has dried and it's really amazing to me how many people don't know that you can work your sky up in several layers. In fact, I always work my sky up in layers unless it's incredibly, incredibly simple because overworking your sky, spending too long working on it when it's starting to dry is what leads almost always to beginners getting loads of back runs and drying marks in their sky, that and using a brush that's too small. So when you've got a complex sky where there's a lot of things going on, you want to work in layers and we're going to work this up in at least three layers. So we've put our warm colours in first. Next, we're going to do our light blues. So I'm just going to re-wet the sky again, clean water all the way down to the horizon. And then I'm going to go in with my blues. Now, although I won't be taking the blues down this bottom part of the picture, I'm still going to wet the whole area. And that's because water alone can cause a drying line. So you see there's a lot of water around the edges here. I'm just going to sweep out with a dry brush so that I don't get any puddles at the edges which come back on later on. And then again, changing to a round brush, I'm going to go in with my blue. I'm getting my blue this time straight from my palette. You see it's quite dry. I don't want drips. If I get drips, it'll go everywhere. So I'm going to go in now with my light blue. Rule number eight is not to overlap colours that make green. Now, do you see that I'm being careful not to overlap this blue 
across the orange and yellow. Now that's important because if I do that I'll get green and green is just about the only colour that you can't get away with in the sky. Now I could put a little bit, let's be brave, I could put a little bit across here on the pink at this point. Could I just ask you to click the like button? It sends a really strong signal to YouTube that this is a good video. So if you are enjoying this video and getting some value from it, if you could click the like button or share it or leave me a comment, I'd be super, super grateful. Pink and blue makes lilac. I've got to be careful to keep it off of that yellow. Rule number nine is if you accidentally make green in your sky, neutralize it by using some pink. Now what happens if I accidentally get the blue across some yellow and I end up with green in my sky? It's just about the only color you can't get away with in a sky. We're not gonna panic. What we're gonna do is add some pink to it. So once I go in with the pink, do you see? The worst that will happen is it'll turn into some kind of grey or brown. If you want it to be more grey, then add a bit more pink and a bit more blue, but it's going to neutralise it. Pink and green, or red and green, are opposite colours, and one will neutralise the other. So if you accidentally get green in your sky, don't panic, add some pink to it. So you can see I haven't gotten that dark up here because I want to add another layer of dark clouds up into my sky in a minute. While that's drying, I'm going to work on the sea. So I'm just going to pretty much mimic what's above. I don't have to be quite as careful here because if I accidentally get green in the sea, it's not such a big deal now, is it? So I'm going to take this water here. Ideally, I'd wait for the sky to dry before doing that. So I'm just going to be careful and not take that water right up. I'm going to leave about a millimetre gap. We're going to do a second layer on the, uh, on the sea so that will be covered up too. And I'm just going to, I'm even just going to stick with the same brush actually and just chuck a little bit of the lighter colours in here. You want to think about mimicking, you know, if there's um, pink at your horizon line, then put pink at the top and so on. So that you're almost doing not an exact mirror image, but somewhere along the lines of. So let's get a bit more pure pink up the top here. I don't want a drying line there, so I'm just going to blend that out with a damp brush if you're not sure about blending I do have a video that's entirely about blending out edges like this so you can have a look at that one I'll put the information up in the info cards above and then from there clean my brush so I don't turn everything green and just go straight in the bottom here with some blue as I said if I get a touch of green it won't matter because we're in the sea now rather than the sky so for the next stage, I want some really strong, fluffy, dark clouds in the sky, which we're going to use to contrast against these lighter areas. So I don't need to go mixing other um, greys and grabbing other colours. I'm going to just use the colours I've used so far. So I've got some yellow. I've got some of the pink. I'm just working from the lid there. Let's mix those together. Now, if you have any colour that's majority blue, any mix of the three primaries that's majority blue, you're going to get a grey. So what we're going to do now is just dump the blue in this until it gets dark enough and becomes grey. Initially, it'll go green, it'll go brown, all sorts of colours. But we're just going to keep putting in until we get a grey. I may also need to go heavier on the pink because if it starts to look like it's just too brown, that means there's too much yellow in it as opposed to the blue and the pink. So I'm going to keep adding those colours until I get that dark grey I'm looking for. So I've got my grey. It's rather nice, but I'm not feeling that it's strong enough. And I would advise when you mix your grey to start with the blue. I was being a bit backwards there, starting with the yellow. I had to put an awful lot of blue and pink in before I got to this kind of brownish grey colour. So I think what I'm going to do actually is add some of our staining colour. Now that's why we started with staining colour so that we can get those strong darks. So I'm going to add a bit of blue violet and probably a bit more of the ordinary blue so that it doesn't go too purple so that we get that kind of blue purple grey that I'm looking for. So it's the same process. If you've used, instead of a pink, if you've used something like a more of a scarlet red, you may find that it spreads a little bit when you put this on. So just sort of, just think about the order that you're applying it. 
um, applying the water. If you're applying to the red first and it starts to spread upwards and it's going everywhere, just start the other side and come down and end on the red and that will stop it spreading too far. Reds tend to bleed a lot more than the other colours. Reds and purples tend to bleed the most and yellows and blues tend to bleed the least. So again, I'm taking out any excess water, cleaning up, and then I'm going to go straight in with this lovely dark purplish grey shade I've made and I'm going to start adding some clouds. Now it's really important here that you don't cover up everything that you've done previously. This may look really dark but when we get to the end it's going to look just fine. Remember that watercolours dry a little bit lighter and so you're going to be adding this drama now. Rule number 10 is there's no light without darks and that's why we're going really dark now because when people have asked me and I've heard them ask other artists you know how, how do you get that sunset effect how do you get that brightness it really glows and you know my, my paintings never look like that there's there's no special trick to it it's not some amazing sort of mix of colors or some special type of paint or anything like that it's good old tonal contrast without darks there are no lights your lights will never ever glow unless you have got sufficient dark paint to show them off now if anything bleeds too much like this one here and you're not happy with that effect just dry your brush and just lift out a bit of the moisture and you'll find that you can stop that effect but you know you may like that effect it's only a bad effect if it goes really too far and is completely out of control. So I'm just going to make sure I've got real strong darks, particularly at the top of the picture. We're going to have these darks down on the horizon here anyway in these hills and they're going to show off the lower part of the painting. Now that my sea is dry, I'm going to do one of my favourite tricks involving candle wax. So what I'm going to do is rub the candle wax horizontally across the paper. Candle wax is transparent so it's going to reserve the underneath colour. So I've put plenty across there. If you're not sure about this technique, I've got other videos on it. Um, also have a play with it on a scrap of paper first. I've added some more violet and some more blue to my, um, my cloud colour just to make it a bit darker and stronger. And now I'm literally going to paint it over the whole of the sea and we should get those nice sparkles appear. I'm going up to the horizon line but not going over the, um, the actual hills. And I'm going to take this colour right the way across. I'm just going to a little bit of clean water as I come to the front here just because I fancy it being a bit lighter at the front. Maybe there's an idea that we're coming in towards the shoreline here. So the last step is to paint these uh, these distant hills and cliffs here. So I've mixed a bit of green up here from the transparent yellow and the blue that we're using. So again, we're sticking with these same four colors. We're not going to introduce any other colors. And I'm going to, I'm going to start the, um, the hills that would be closest to us a little bit lighter and then go much darker as we go further back. I say darker but I mean really cooler so we're going to get some warmer shades here and maybe drop in a bit more of the yellow. You never want to use just one colour where you can drop others in. We can even if we want to go straight in with a little bit of pink and you know get some really interesting effects going on here. And these are the colours that I'm using closer towards us, a bit sort of lighter and a bit more interesting. I've still got this big puddle of sort of a purplish colour, so when I want a few darks I can just drop a little bit of this in and get this impression that there's multiple things going on with this landscape. You want to go a little bit darker towards the base here where there would naturally be areas in shadow. Make sure you're not leaving any white gap between the landscape and the sea. You don't want a white gap here. I'm going to do the same to this area here and then just go a little bit cooler 
as and a little bit bluer as we go further back. I'm going to let each one of these dry so that we get a distinction between those areas. So I'm just putting the last of these sort of distant hills in. You can see I've kept the colours really interesting, not just gone sort of one colour across the whole thing. And I've put some darks in there as well. Now I've kept this tutorial really simple. I could have spent much longer on this. I could have gone over these um, these hillsides multiple times. I could have gone into the sky more times. Actually on some large landscapes, I've gone into skies as many as 10 or 11 times. As long as you let it dry each time and re-wet with clean water and you're on good paper, you're on stretched paper, you should be able to keep going in. There's our finished landscape. I'm really, really pleased with that. Now, if I had used a different set of four colours, I would have got an entirely different feeling. So you need to choose the colours with, uh, by being informed with the uh, with the source material that you're using, with the photographs or whatever it is that you're using or the idea you have in your head. That's what wants to inform you about choosing your three primaries, choosing your staining colour. And um, if you do really well, you can paint your hands too. If you followed along with this tutorial and you'd like to show me or other people the results, do consider joining my Facebook group. The link is in the video description. It's free to join and it's a lovely, safe, welcoming space for you to show your artwork. And let me know in the comments which one of these rules you found most useful and if you're going to be applying any of them to your own work in the future. If you found this video useful, you can watch another one of my tutorials right now.